Hey everyone, it's Dr. Marcon, and this is chapter 10 on skeletal muscle tissue. So what is muscle? Muscle, uh, it's derived from the Latin word for little mouse. We know that muscle is the primary tissue in the heart, as well as the walls ho of hollow organs, and we also have skeletal muscle tissue, which makes up nearly half the body's mass. So with the heart, we have our cardiac muscle tissue. Within the walls of hollow organs, we have smooth muscle tissue. We have different properties of muscle tissue. We have contractility. So myofilaments, these are filaments within the muscle, are responsible for shortening of muscle cells. And we have two types of myofilaments. We have actin and myosin. Excitability. Uh, with this property, nerve cells excite muscle cells, causing electrical impulses to travel along the sarcolemma. Extensibility. Extensibility, so contraction of a skeletal muscle stretches the opposing muscle. We also know that smooth muscle is stretched by substances within that hollow organ. For example, when we have food in our stomach, this stretches the smooth muscle in the stomach, as well as urine in the urinary bladder. The last property we'll talk about is elasticity. Uh, muscle has the ability to recoil after being stretched. We talked about the different connective fibers or connective tissue fibers that are within muscles, such as, for example, elastic tissue, allowing for that recoil property. So just want to go over the terminology that is specific to muscle tissue. Whenever you see the prefixes myo or mys, M-Y-S, this prefix means muscle. Sarco, uh, this is also another prefix pertaining to muscle tissue. Sarco is a prefix meaning flesh. So for example, we have specific organelles for muscle tissue that relate to generalized uh, organelles of cells. So with the sarcolemma, the sarcolemma is uh, the plasma membrane of muscle cells. Sarcoplasm is the cytoplasm of muscle cells. We have different functions of muscle tissue. One of the main functions, of course, is to produce movement. Skeletal muscle is attached to skeletal bone and moves the body by moving the bones. Smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is important. We know we, found, we find them in the linings of the hollow organ. Smooth muscle squeezes fluids and other substances like a baby out of the uterus uh, through the hollow organs. Smooth, uh, muscle tissue is also important because we can find them um, in the opening and closing of body passageways. We have uh, muscles called sphincters. So these sphincters open and close body passageways. They basically function as valves. They can open to allow passage of a substance and then contract to close the passageway. Tissue, muscle tissue also helps maintain posture and stabilize joints. This enables the body to remain sitting or standing. Also, muscle tone helps stabilize many synovial joints. Uh, muscle tissue is also important for heat generation. So muscle contractions help produce heat and helps with the homeostatic nature of the body, helps maintain normal body temperature. So in the first unit, we talked about the different types of muscle tissue. And we know there are three types of muscle tissue. We have skeletal muscle tissue, cardiac muscle tissue, and smooth muscle tissue. So in this chapter, we're going to uh, talk about these different types of muscle tissue. We know what they look like under a microscope, but let's talk a little bit about each uh, type of muscle tissue. So first, we'll talk about skeletal muscle tissue. Uh, skeletal muscle tissue is packaged into skeletal muscles and makes up about 40% of our body weight. We know that the cells of skeletal muscle tissue are striated, meaning they have those uh, alternating dark and light bands. We know that skeletal muscle is innervated by voluntary division of the nervous system, meaning we do have voluntary control over our skeletal muscle. The second type of muscle tissue is cardiac muscle tissue. We know that this is found only in the walls of the heart. Again, we'll see lovely striations of cardiac muscle tissue. However, unlike skeletal muscle, the uh, 
cardiac muscle cells are branching, they're uninucleates, and they have structures uh, where these cells interdigitate, and these are called intercalated discs. This kind of separates um, with regards to what they look like. It kind of differentiates cardiac muscle from skeletal muscle. Um, also, one of the things that kind of differentiate cardiac muscle from uh, skeletal muscle is that cardiac muscle uh, contraction is involuntary. Again, we're not sitting here telling our heart to beat as we sit there. No, the cardiac muscle actually, there are cardiac centers within our brain. Also, the uh, cells within the heart uh, are under, um, they have their, their own ability to contract on their own. And then the third type of muscle tissue is smooth muscle tissue. We know that this is located in the walls of hollow organs. Uh, just by the name alone, we know that these cells do not have striations. And again, they are innervated by involuntary division of the nervous system, meaning they are under involuntary control. So with skeletal muscle, each muscle is an organ, consists mostly of muscle tissue. Skeletal muscle also contains connective tissue as well as blood vessels and nerves. Going over the gross anatomy of a skeletal muscle, it is made up of connective tissue and fascicles. We have sheaths of connective tissue that bind a skeletal muscle and, and its fibers together. So the outermost uh, covering or outermost sheath is known as the epimesium. Epimesium is dense, regular connective tissue surrounding the entire muscle. The middle layer is the paramecium. So paramecium surrounds each fascicle, and we know that a fascicle is a group of muscle fibers. And surrounding each individual muscle fiber is the innermost layer, which is the endomesium. Endomesium is a fine sheath of connective tissue wrapping each muscle cell or muscle fiber. So we have muscle fibers or individual muscle cells that come together and form a fascicle. Now we know that the individual muscle cells surrounded by endomesium and then the groups of muscle fibers that form the fascicle is covered by paramecium and a bunch of muscle fascicles make up an entire muscle and this is surrounded by uh, sheaths of connective tissue known as the epimesium which is the outermost layer of connective tissue. So these connective tissue sheaths that surround the entire muscle or the epimesium is continuous with tendons. So when muscle fibers contract, a pull is exerted on all layers of connective tissue um, and this forms a tendon. Sheaths provide elasticity and also carry blood vessels and nerves. So here we see a diagram of uh, the gross anatomy of the skeletal muscle along with its connective uh, tissue layer sheaths. So we know that an individual muscle fiber or muscle cell is surrounded by endomesium. That's the innermost lining. All these individual muscle fibers form a, a muscle fascicle. So the fascicle, uh, is surrounded by paramecium. Okay, so we see um, all of this, all these muscle fibers forming a fascicle. This fascicle is surrounded by paramecium, and then a bunch of fascicles will then form the actual skeletal muscle. And the covering for the uh, entire uh, muscle is epimecium. This is the outermost layer. And we know that epimecium. Um, and the connective tissue sheaths are continuous with a tendon. So each skeletal muscle is, um, with regards to nerve supply and blood supply, each skeletal muscle is supplied by branches of one nerve, one artery, and then one or more veins. Nerves and vessels will branch repeatedly, and the smallest branches will serve individual muscle fibers or individual muscle cells.
Now, how are these muscles attached? So with regards to muscle attachments, most skeletal muscles run from one bone to another. So one bone will move while the other bone remains fixed. So the less movable attachment, this is known as the muscle's origin. Okay, so this is the less movable attachment of the skeletal muscle. The insertion of the skeletal muscle is the more movable attachment. So the skeletal muscle will insert onto a bone and this bone is more movable, meaning it moves more than the origin. So the origin is the less movable attachment. The insertion of a skeletal muscle is the more movable attachment. Here we have an example of the brachialis muscle. We know that the origin of the brachialis muscle is along the shaft of the humerus. It will insert uh, into the ulna. The ulna here we see is more, is more medial. And we, it has its attachments on the coronoid process, which is the uh, proximal portion of the ulna. So because the humerus is the less movable attachment, this is known as the brachialis's origin. And the muscle or the muscle tendon will then attach to uh, the proximal portion of the ulna or the coronoid process of the ulna. And we know that the ulna is the bone that actually ends up moving the most. So this is uh, known as the insertion. Uh, and this is by indirect attachment. So the brachialis has its origin on the humerus, the shaft of the humerus, and its insertion on the proximal portion of the ulna. And we know we can move uh, the forearm uh, closer to the humerus. So decreasing this angle between the ulna and the radius and the humerus, this is known as flexion. So uh, decreasing this angle is flexion ex uh, and then increasing the angle between the two um, structures is known as extension, like extending uh, your, your arm. So with regards to muscle attachments, muscle attached to origins and insertions by connective tissue. Uh, with the fleshy attachments, the connective tissues are, fibers are short. Indirect attachments, uh, connective tissue forms a tendon or aponeurosis. Bone markings present where tendons meet um, bones. I'm sorry, bone markings are present where tendons meet bones. So again, we talked about the different bony markings that can serve as attachment sites for either tendons or muscles. So these include tubercles, trochanters, and crests. So then we're going to talk about uh, muscle fibers, the microscopic, microscopic and functional anatomy of uh, skeletal muscle tissue, specifically the skeletal muscle fiber. We know that uh, the muscle fiber is also known as the muscle cell. The skeletal muscle fiber is the basic unit of skeletal muscle. These fibers are long and cylindrical. They are huge cells. The diameter of these cells are anywhere between 10 to 100 micrometers or microns. Length, uh, the length of these muscle fibers can go from several centimeters to dozens of centimeters. Each cell is formed by fusion of embryonic cells. We know that these cells are multinucleate, meaning they have many nuclei, and the nuclei are peripherally located. So here we see the microscope, microscopic anatomy of skeletal muscle fiber. And again, skeletal muscle fiber is also known as the muscle cell. So we have individual uh, myofibrils that are basically um, just long rods within cytoplasm. So striations of the skeletal muscle are a result of the structure of these myofibrils. So we have myofibrils that make up the skeletal muscle cell or skeletal muscle fiber. Um, and again, we have the uh, sheath of connective tissue surrounding individual muscle fibers known and as endomesium. So this individual muscle fiber, uh, we have the different organelles that make up 
this cell, we have the nuclei, we have the mitochondria. Again, there are lots of mitochondria in skeletal muscle fibers uh, because they need more energy. And then we see the alternating striations of uh, dark bands and light bands. Dark bands, you know, there's the letter A in dark, so it represents, represents an A band. And the light band has an I in it, so this represents an I band. We'll talk about the different bands when we talk about the um, functional unit of the skeletal muscle tissue, which is this, the uh, sarcomere, in just a little bit. So here we see just a diagram of one individual muscle fiber, again, made up of myofibrils um, and other organelles. So myofibrils, uh, the striations of the skeletal muscle fiber is due to the internal structure of myofibrils. Myofibrils are long rods within the cytoplasm, make up about 80% of the cytoplasm, and are a specialized contractile organelle found in muscle tissue. And these myofibrils are made up of long rows of repeating segments called sarcomeres. And the sarcomeres are the functional unit of skeletal muscle tissue. So a sarcomere, again, being the basic unit of contraction of skeletal muscle, has different elements to it. We have what's known as Z discs or the Z line. These are the boundaries of each sarcomere. It is then made up of different filaments. We have thin actin filaments that will extend from the Z disc toward the center of the sarcomere. And then we have our thick myosin filaments. These are located in the center of the sarcomere. And they, uh, the ends overlap, uh, the inner ends overlap with the ends of the thin filaments. And the thick uh, myosin filaments contain ATPase enzymes, which is important for uh, breaking down ATP into c its components uh, to release energy. The A bands, which are made up of the dark bands, um, make up the full length of the thick myosin filaments and will also include the inner ends of the thin filaments. The H zone is the center part of the A band where no thin filaments occur. So it's made up just of the thick myosin filaments. Uh, A bands and I bands reflect polarized light differently. So A bands are known as N isotropic, whereas I bands are isotropic. Now the M line, the M line is in the center of that H zone. Uh, the M line contains tiny rods that will hold thick filaments together. And then the I band, that light band, is the region where, with only thin filaments, meaning there are no thick filaments within this region, and lies within two adjacent sarcomeres. So if we look at a picture of our sarcomere, we can see that uh, we have the Z disks. So from Z disk to Z disk makes up one sarcomere. Okay, so Z disk to Z disk. From the Z disk, we have the thin mil film filaments that extend uh, from this line or the Z line. And then they will extend and then op overlap with the dark myosin uh, thick filaments here. So these darker red lines, those are the thick myosin filaments. And you can see they kind of overlap with the thinner actin filaments. And uh, the H zone is where uh, only thick filaments occur. Within the H zone, you have that M line that hold the thick filaments uh, together. So the A band will go from the end of uh, a thick myosin filament to another. Um, it will contain areas where they overlap with thin filaments. However, you reach the middle part, which is the H zone, where there are no thin filaments. And we can actually see this a little bit better in the next slide. So here we see one sarcomere. So here's a Z disc, here's the Z disc. So from C, Z disc to Z disc, this is one sarcomere. Okay, and then extending from the Z line is a thin filament, this line in blue. So this is a thin filament. And we can see at some point that part of the thin filament will overlap with the thick myosin filament, okay? Um, and then from the end of one thick filament to another, that makes the A band, which is the dark band. So let's actually draw this out. 
which I love to do. Okay, so from here to here, that's the A band that is made up of uh, both thick and thin filaments, which makes it dark. Uh, and then we'll have a part of the A-band where there are no thin filaments. So we can see the thin filament kind of ends here. So this zone right here, this is known as the H-band uh, or the H-region. So there are no thin filaments here. It's just dark uh, myosin or thick myosin filaments. And then in the center of this H band, we have the M line, and this is where the thick myosin filaments will attach. Okay. So make sure you know the different structures of the sarcomere. Uh, what makes up the A band? What is within the H band? Uh, what is the M line? Okay. So make sure to study that. So there are other structures within the sarcomere. We have titan. Titan is a spring-like molecule that will resist overstretching. Titan molecules will extend from the Z disk to thick filaments to the M line. Uh, two functions of titan includes to hold the thick filaments in place and then unfolds when the muscle is stretched. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a specialized type of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. It's just uh, basically the organelle, the same organelle within a generalized cell, but in muscle cells. So there are interconnecting tubules that surround each myofibril. Some tubules will form cross channels called terminal cisterns. Uh, cisterns occur in pairs on either side of a T tubule. So pairs of cisterns plus the T tubule actually makes up a triad. The sarcoplasm plasmic reticulum contains calcium ions. Calcium ions are important. It's an important ion because they are released when muscle is stimulated to contract. Um, calcium ions will then diffuse through the cytoplasm and help trigger the sliding filament mechanism, uh, the video which I asked you guys to watch. So basically calcium will bind to sites on the thin actin filaments to allow the thick myosin filaments to uh, bind to the sites on the actin filament and then allow for contraction by movement um, of the uh, thin filaments towards the center of the sarcomere. Now T-tubules, these are deep invaginations of the sarcolemma. Uh, and the triad again is that T-tubule blanked or flanked by two terminal cisterns. And this structure is important because when we have uh, the electrical signal coming from the nervous system for a muscle to contract, the electrical signal will then travel down the T-tubules um, and then allow for basically the stimulation to release calcium ions. And then this will allow for contraction of the muscle. So here we see the sarcoplasmic reticulum and T tubules in the skeletal muscle fiber. So this white uh, band right here, this is the T tubule, and then surrounded by a pair of cisterns, those are the that makes up the triad. So once we have again a signal for a contraction to occur, the signal will will travel down the T tubules to then. Uh, go along the tubules of the sarcoplasmic reticulum to allow for the release of calcium ions and then allowing for contraction to occur. There are two types, two major types of contraction. We have concentric contraction. This is when muscle will shorten to do work. And then we have eccentric contraction. Basically, the muscle will generate force as it lengthens. This will, muscle acts sort of as a break to help re re uh, resist gravity. This is, for example, the down portion of a push-up. So that is an example of eccentric contraction. So this brings us to the mechanism of contraction. We have what's known as the sliding filament mechanism theory, which explains concentric contraction. So we have myosin heads. Um, myosin heads contained or located on the thick filaments. 
Um, these myosin heads will attach to thin filaments, receptors on the thil thin filaments at both ends of a sarcomere. Uh, the myosin heads on the thick uh, filament will then pull the thin filaments towards the center of the sarcomere. Now, while this is happening, the sarcomere does shorten. However, the thin and thick filaments do not. They just slide past one another and don't actually uh, shorten. They just move. So thin and thick filaments do not shorten, but the sarcomere length will. This is what causes contraction. So this whole mechanism is initiated by the release of calcium ions from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And of course, uh, this is an action that does require energy, so this mechanism is powered by ATP. So here we kind of see a close look at the different filaments that make up the sarcomere. So we have the thin actin filaments that have receptors for these kind of golf club uh, like structures. These are the myosin heads of the thick myosin filaments. So uh, once calcium enters the scene with the, uh, the release of an electrical stimulation from the nervous system, basically what happens is calcium uh, will help open the receptor sites for the myosin heads um, on the thin filament. And using ATP, these, uh, these myosin heads will then kind of pull the thin filament towards the center of the sarcomere, allowing for the two filaments to slide past one another, um, causing a contraction. So the myosin heads attach to actin in the thin filaments, then pivot to pull the thin filaments inwards or, or towards the center of the sarcomere. So the contraction of these filaments or the sarcomere changes the striation pattern. When fully relaxed, the thin filaments will partially overlap uh, the thick filaments. And then contraction occurs as the Z discs move closer together. Uh, the sarcomere length shortens the I band will shorten and the H zone. So the H zone uh, where there were no thin filaments uh, uh, will actually disappear. However, the A band remains the same length. So the A band being from the end of uh, the thick filament to the other. So A band remains the same length. Okay, so make sure you study this slide and kind of understand what happens to the different bands uh, during contraction which one shortens, which one stays the same, that kind of thing. So here is a picture of a fully relaxed sarcomere of a muscle fiber. We still have that appreciable uh, H band where there are no thin filaments. We just have that M line where the thick filaments will attach. So no th thin filaments here. And we see that the Z discs are an appropriate length. Um, and we can see only a part of the thin filament, thin active filament, uh, partially overlaps the thick filament. However, when we go to a fully contracted sarcomere, we can see that this H band disappears because then the actin filaments are being pulled towards that M line. So we no longer have that H band. We can see that the Z discs are being pulled closer together as well. However, notice how the A band length never changes it still stays the same okay and we can see that the thin film is being pulled towards that center of the sarcomere so make sure you understand what occurs during contraction again and actually i've included a link to the video on sliding filament mechanism to help you understand better uh, that concept so make sure you are comfortable with the information on that video if you have any questions please don't hesitate to ask so um, with regards to um, muscle extension, the muscle is stretched by a movement opposite that contracts it. Um, we have muscle fiber length and force of contraction. So the greatest force produced um, is produced when a fiber starts out slightly stretched. Uh, mice and heads can pull along the entire length of the thin filaments allowing for this contraction. Again, we talked about tighten 
just as spring-like molecule in the sarcomeres, which helps resist overstretching, will hold the thick filaments in place. Again, we have that A-band made up um, of those thick fil uh, myosin filaments that do not lengthen or shorten. Tighten will unfold when the muscle is stretched. So just a table in chapter 10 of your book showing the structure and organizational levels of skeletal muscle. So at the highest level, we have the organ. This is the muscle. Again, the entire muscle being surrounded by that uh, connective tissue sheath called the epimysium. We then have the, um, the muscle fascicle, which is a portion of the muscle. So within the muscle, we have many numbers of fascicles, and this is surrounded by paramecium. Um, so we know that a muscle consists of hundreds to thousands of muscle cells plus connective tissue wrappings, the blood vessels, and nerve fibers. Uh, the whole entire muscle, again, is covered by epimysium. The muscle fascicle surrounded by paramecium. So is a discrete bundle of muscle cells uh, segregated from the rest of the muscle by, again, another connective tissue sheath. Muscle Fascicles are made up of individual muscle fibers or muscle cells. Uh, these muscle fibers are surrounded by endomesium. And then um, a muscle fiber is an elongated multinucleate cell, has uh, striations uh, that we saw uh, in the histo slides. And then individual muscle cells or muscle fibers are surrounded by endomesium. And then within the cell, we have organelles called myofibrils. So these are complex organelles containing myofilaments, such as our actin and our myosin. Uh, myofibrils are rod-like contractile organelles um, that occupy most of the muscle cell volume, composed of the structural units called sarcomeres that are arranged end-to-end, -end, uh, appear banded, and uh, the bands of adjacent myofibrils are, of course, aligned. And then... Within the myofibrils, we have the structural unit, which is the sarcomere. Again, a segment of myofibril, which will go from Z-disc to Z-disc. Um, again, this is the contractile unit composed of the myofilaments, actin and myosin, um, which are made up of contractile proteins. So we have the thick myosin filaments and the thin uh, actin filaments. So here we see uh, the... Myofilaments or filaments, again, we have the thick filaments held um, by this M line. We have the H band here where we have no uh, actin filaments or thin filaments. And then um, kind of overlapping, we have the thin actin filaments. So we have, again, two types of myofilaments, thick and thin, contained, bundled, um, depending on if they're thick or thin, the thick filaments have bundled myosin, whereas the thin mil uh, filaments have bundled actin. Um, and the sliding of the thin filaments past the thick filaments will produce muscle shortening or muscle contraction. Uh, we also have elastic filaments that are composed of tightened molecules that maintain the organization of the A-band and provide for that elastic recoil uh, when muscle contraction ends. With regards to innervation of the skeletal muscle, we have motor neurons that will innervate skeletal muscle tissue. Um, we have structures within the motor neurons. So for example, we have a neuromuscular junction. This is the point where the nerve ending um, and the muscle fiber will meet. Uh, within the neuromuscular junction, we have uh, structures, which is uh, basically the end of an axon of a neuron known as terminal boutons or terminal buttons. So terminal boutons are located at the ends of axons and store neurotransmitters. And we'll learn about what neurotransmitters are, but basically neurotransmitters are sort of like hormones that will help um, send the chemical signal from the neuron to the muscle. So between the muscle fiber and the terminal bouton at the neuromuscular junction, we have this space called the synaptic cleft. The synaptic cleft is the space between the axon terminal and the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber. 
So here we see uh, the neuromuscular junction and the events that allow for stimulation uh, to allow for muscle contraction to occur. So here are the events at the neuromuscular junction. So first we have a nerve impulse. This nerve impulse coming from the axon, it will stimulate the release of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine into the synaptive cleft. So here we see the myelinated axon of uh, the motor neuron, and here we have our terminal boutons that contain the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So the electrical impulse will travel down the axon, the myelinated axon, to the terminal bouton at the neuromuscular junction, uh, which will then release the neurotransmitter uh, into the synaptic cleft, and from there the neurotransmitter will bind to receptors onto the sarcolemma. So acetylcholine stimulates changes in the sarcolemma that excite the muscle fiber. Um, so we have the release of calcium ions. Um, but for that, so the stimulus coming from the axon or the, the neuron uh, is carried down the T-tubules to initiate fiber contraction with the release of calcium. So enzymes in the synaptic cleft will break down acetylcholine which will then kind of limit the action to a single muscle twitch. So you don't want a bunch of acetylcholine hanging out for too long. You just want one, you know, stimulus to occur. And then once uh, the stimulus has, uh, you know, released a signal into the muscle fiber, we'll have enzymes will, that will break down acetylcholine so that we only have a single muscle twitch. So we can see that the axons of the motor neurons will extend from the spinal cord to the muscle. Uh, there, each axon will divide into a number of terminal boutons that form neuromuscular junctions with muscle fibers that are scattered throughout the muscle. And we can here see the uh, that going on in this histo slide. We can see branching axon of a motor unit and then terminal boutons at neuromuscular junctions onto the muscle fibers. So we have different types of skeletal muscle fibers. They are uh, categorized according to two characteristics. First, how they manufacture ATP, which is our form of energy that we use to do work, and then how quickly they contract. So the first type of fibers we're going to talk about are oxidative fibers. So oxidative fibers actually will produce ATP aerobically. What does that mean? Aerobically means there needs to be the presence of oxygen. Uh, and then we have glycolytic fi uh, fibers. Glycolytic fibers will produce ATP anaerobically. So anaerobically meaning without oxygen, uh, but we do it they are able to produce ATP through glycolysis. So glycolysis is basically the breakdown of the stored form of glucose, which is glycogen. Uh, so breaking down glycogen will uh, help produce ATP, which we use for energy. So we have oxidative fibers that produce ATP aerobically for the use of oxygen. Anaerobically, glycolytic fibers will produce ATP by, uh, by glycolysis. So these skeletal my muscle fibers will then be divided into three classes. Um, we have our slow oxidative fibers, again, oxidative requiring oxygen to, to produce ATP aerobically. Um, and then an example of the, our slow oxidative fibers are our red slow oxidative fibers. Then we have fast glycolytic fibers. Uh, an example of this are the white fast glycolytic fibers, which we'll talk about. And then intermediate, we have our fast oxidative fibers. So these are intermediate fibers. Again, oxidative uh, requiring oxygen, glycolytic do not require oxygen, rather produce ATP through anaerobic means via glycolysis. So first we'll talk about our slow oxidative fibers. These are our red uh, fibers. They're red due to an abundant myoglobin. They obtain energy from oxygen or aerobic met metabolic reactions requiring oxygen. They contain a large number of mitochondria and they are richly supplied with capillaries. They are slow, so they contract slowly and are resistant to fatigue. These fibers are very small in diameter.
So many of these fibers, um, again, are extremely resistant to fatigue as long as enough oxygen are, is present, um, deliver prolonged contractions. These make up many of the fibers in our postural muscles of the lower back. So these are the muscles that help maintain our posture. Um, and these muscles must contract continuously to keep the spine straight and maintain uh, posture. However, because they are thin, slow oxidative fibers do not generate much power. Then we have our fast, fast glycolytic fibers. Fast glycolytic fibers contain little myoglobin and few mitochondria. They're about twice the diameter of slow oxidative fibers. However, they contain more myofilaments and generate more power. And again, depend on anaerobic pathways. So they are able to make ATP through glycolysis or the breakdown of glycogen. Uh, fast glycolytic fibers contract, contract rapidly and tire quickly. Uh, they are common in the muscles of the upper limbs, which often can lift heavy objects, but for brief periods. The next type of fiber, um, which are, are intermediates, these are fast oxidative fibers. Fast oxidative fibers have an intermediate diameter. They contract quickly like fast glycolytic fibers, but are oxygen dependent. Uh, they have a high myoglobin content and rich supply of capillaries and are somewhat fatigue resistant. Um, however, they are more powerful than slow oxidative fibers. Um, they are abundant in muscles of the lower limbs, which have to move the body for long periods of time. Um, so for example, a muscle in the calf of the leg uses its glycolytic fibers to propel the body in short sprints. So if we're talking about sprints, uh, sh glycolytic fibers are more um, favorable, whereas with fast oxidative fibers, uh, they're more favorable for long distance running. And like I'm, we said before, compared to slow oxidative fibers, we know that slow oxidative fibers are actually more favorable uh, for the muscles that maintain uh, our posture or our standing posture. So here is a table in your book that compares the different types of muscle in your body. We have skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle. It's a great table because it kind of um, bases the characteristics based on body location as well as uh, what they look like histologically, uh, histologically. So here we see body location of the three different types of muscles. Again, skeletal muscle we'll see attached to bones or some facial muscles uh, to the skin. Uh, cardiac muscle we'll only see in the walls of the heart and smooth muscle mostly in the walls of hollow organs, such as the stomach, respiratory tubes, bladder, blood vessels, and uterus. And here we see a comparison of the different uh, skeletal muscle, or the different muscle tissue um, under histoslides that we saw in unit one. Here we see these long parallel muscle fibers um, with striations. Uh, we have peripherally located multinuclei. And then cardiac muscle, we see the branching of the cardiac muscle um, with the intercalated discs as well as striations. And smooth muscle sort of looks like dense, regular connective tissue, but um, is different because uh, we have fusiform type cells within this tissue. And it's different from skeletal and cardiac muscle because there are no striations. Again, I would study the different connective tissue components. Here it shows you uh, within the different connective tissue components within the, uh, the three types of muscle. We saw the different layers in skeletal muscle. We can see um, within cardiac muscle, um, endomesium is the predominant connective tissue that attach uh, to, uh, the endomesium is attached to the fibrous skeleton of the heart. So we can see the attachment of these cardiac muscle cells via the endomesium which will attach to that fiber skeleton. And then in smooth muscle, again, we'll see um, predominantly endomesium uh, kind of bringing together the smooth muscle cells. Here we see a comparison of, you know, whether or not myofibrils are present um, or presence of myofibrils composed of sarcomeres. Yes, we'll see that in skeletal and cardiac muscle, but um, within cardiac, the myofibrils are of irregular thickness, and you do not see that in smooth muscle, but there are actinomycin filaments that are present 
throughout smooth muscle. And then whether or not we have the presence of T tubules um, and sites of invagination, of course, we'll see it in skeletal muscle. We talked about that um, as well as we can see it in cardiac muscle. Uh, we'll see a T tubule, one in each sarcomere at the Z disc. Um, however, these are larger diameter than those of skeletal muscle, and you will not find T tubules in smooth muscle. And then other characteristics that we can kind of differentiate between the three, including uh, whether or not there's an elaborate sarcoplasmic reticulum, uh, using s calcium for uh, the calcium pulse, or the source of calcium for the calcium pulse, of course, we'll find it in the sarcoplasmic reticulum in all three. Uh, whether or not we have presence of gap junctions, those uh, structures that allow for communications between cells, you won't find it in skeletal muscle, but you will find it in cardiac as well as smooth muscle. And then whether or not these cells exhibit individual neuromuscular junctions, yes, in skeletal muscle, and uh, no for both cardiac and smooth. And then regulation of contraction, whether it's voluntary or involuntary. We know that skeletal muscle tissue is the only muscle tissue that is under voluntary control uh, versus cardiac and smooth, which are both under involuntary control. Because uh, we know that cardiac muscle, we it has its own intrinsic system of regulation. We'll talk about that when we get to the cardiovascular system with the pacemaker cells. Um, also, we all have... Uh, cardiac centers within our brain, uh, the autonomic nervous system that will also control the cardiac muscle. And again, for smooth muscle under involuntary control. Energy. So skeletal muscle utilizes both aerobic and anaerobic metabolism. Um, so it can have uh, methods of obtaining ATP through uh, either in conditions with or without oxygen. For cardiac muscle, oxygen, of course, is required. And smooth muscle, it's mostly or mainly aerobic, meaning oxygen does have to be present. For disorders of muscle tissue, muscle tissues experience few disorders. Um, the heart muscle, of course, is the exception. There are many uh, cardiovascular pathologies that we could talk about, but we'll wait till the cardiovascular section. Skeletal muscle is remarkably resistant to infection unless, of course, you have a patient that has diabetes that's prone to poor blood supply, which can cause uh, gangrene in some muscle tissue if there's an injury that isn't taken care of. But for the most part, uh, skeletal muscle is resistant to infection. Smooth muscle will probably, any problems will probably stem from external irritants. But we do have some... Um, pathologies that you know we can talk about for example muscular dystrophy muscular dystrophy is a group of inherited muscle destroying diseases um, the affected muscles will enlarge with fat and connective tissue which will then um, encourage muscles to degenerate or break down and there are different types of muscular dystrophy we have duchenne's muscular dystrophy and myotonic dystrophy we also have myofascial pain syndrome. This is when we have pain that is caused by tightened bands of muscle fibers. And then we have a, a condition that a lot of people that you might have uh, heard about, which is fibromyalgia. This is a mysterious chronic pain syndrome that affects mostly women. And some symptoms include fatigue, sleep abnormalities, severe musculoskeletal pain, and headache. Now, notice these symptoms are, are not very specific to any one disease. So it's kind of hard to diagnose fibromyalgia because all these symptoms could be anything. But um, usually if we have these symptoms plus severe musculoskeletal pain, we can, you know, maybe rule in fibromyalgia. So talking about muscle tissue throughout life, um, we know that muscle tissue develops from myoblasts. Again, myo being that prefix that means muscles. Uh, blasts, just an immature type of cell. So myoblasts will fuse to form skeletal muscle fibers. And then we'll see by week seven, uh, skeletal muscles contract. Um, so here we see our endodermic mesoderm cells, which will undergo cell division to increase in number and enlarge forming our myoblasts. Several myoblasts will fuse together to form 
a myotube. Um, a myotube is an immature multinucleate muscle fiber. And we'll have saddles, satellite cells that kind of surround uh, the myotube. As the myotube matures, it will mature into skeletal muscle fiber. And here we can see a mature skeletal muscle fiber. Cardiac muscle, um, usually by around week three, we can see the uh, cardiac muscle start to pump blood. Uh, we talked about skeletal cells the last slide. Skeletal satellite cells uh, surround skeletal muscle fibers. They resemble undifferentiated myoblasts. They will fuse into existing muscle fibers to help them grow. Now, of course, we'll see differences in amounts of skeletal muscle between males and females. For females, skeletal muscle makes up approximately 36% of body mass. And in males, it makes up approximately 42% of uh, body mass. And this difference is usually due to the effect of androgens. These are hormones in males. So males have more androgens that will affect uh, percent body mass of skeletal muscle. And of course, with increased age, we know that the amount of connective tissue uh, increases in muscles, but the number of muscle fibers decrease. You know, if you don't use it, you lose it. So we have a loss of muscle mass with aging. Usually we have a decrease in muscular strength at about 50% by eight years old. Um, and then we have a condition known as sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is just known as muscle wasting. Okay. So that's it for this chapter on skeletal muscle. Um, and yeah, be prepared for the quiz, you guys.